Wow. All right. So first, the Armenia-India controversy. So hold your horses back up. We don't know who's the champion yet today. But yesterday, they had semifinals, and there was a match between India and Armenia. And uh, Kostya, what are your thoughts on that match? Well, I guess we should give some backstory. Uh, basically, this was the semifinal match, and... Um, what happened was an Armenian player disconnected. I believe it was Haik Martirosian. Um, I don't remember exactly what was the situation in, in the match. I don't want to give the... But I I think Armenia needed to win that game to at least catch up in the match, if I'm not mistaken. I'll say that it was probably three... Uh, it was probably two and a half to two and a half, and Armenia was down a pawn with a fortress. Oh, I see. So they needed to hold that draw for the first round to finish in a 3-3 tie. Got it. Um, <laughs> so uh, so he ends up disconnecting with around a minute on his clock in flags. Uh, Armenia immediately files an appeal because uh, they feel like the disconnection wasn't his fault. Uh, the way I understand the rules that Chess.com has used for many years now, I think with all of the uh, like um, Title Tuesday and Speech Chess Championships and, and everything, is basically like it, it's up to the player to take care of their internet connection, and if it fails, it's like usually on the player. Uh, that said, if it turns out that it's some kind of like server issue, like if Chess.com goes down or if like Cloudflare goes down or something, that's not really the player's home internet's fault then there's like there's things they can do they can replay the match restart from a given position like i think i think that part is usually left up to discretion as it was for the armenia match and then today's in the uh, russia match mm -hmm. um so by the way feel free to correct me i don't want to get anything like factually wrong um in terms of the 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 details sure um but basically armenia was very upset because they felt like their internet was fine. Uh, their evidence for that was that uh, Hike was still connected on a Zoom call, which other people pointed out, like, just because you're connected to Zoom does not necessarily mean you're connected to chess.com, which I actually found very strange because when I lose internet, I lose everything. I lose a Zoom call and I lose the chess.com connection. So yeah. I don't, I, in fact, like a lot of times when I've been on like Skype with a student, and then uh, we have a problem with like the analysis board, like we lose our connection. If we're still talking on Skype, then we quickly realize, okay, it's a chess.com server issue because we're, we're still connected. And then we refresh and then, then things get fixed. Um, so there's some, there's definitely a technical debate to be had uh, over like who's actually at fault for like the fact that the player disconnected. But I think there's also a second debate to be had over what the penalty or what the consequences should be when someone disconnects and it's not their fault when someone disconnects and let's say it is their internet's fault, which I actually don't necessarily believe should be just 100% on the player. Um, like for instance, I had a stream a couple of weeks ago and then my whole internet went out and then it turned out that Comcast, my provider was doing apparently scheduled maintenance uh, yep. in the middle of a day, like on a work day, didn't like notify me or anything. I remember notified that. me after the internet went out. <laughs> yeah, we were doing a big stream. We were doing like yeah. the the super event. And so like I, I mean if that happened to me during my match with Lawrence Strand or something, they would have probably forfeited me. Um, or at least for one game until I could get back on my phone or something. But I don't feel like that would have been my fault in any way whatsoever. Uh, if that had caused me to like lose the game. So I think it basically two separate discussions to be had one about the specific details and what's right in like the India Armenia uh, decision and one just like a general philosophical discussion about like you know internet is not perfect and it's very unstable and of course online chess basically just started this year like in the last couple of months out of necessity in terms of running like very very important online events like the Olympiad which a lot of countries take extremely seriously yeah um and so yeah <laughs> you can take any any of that and go all right um well yeah i think that like the rules are something that will need to be fleshed out increasingly over time into more detail right because i don't think initially they were intended to be that robust it was mainly chess.com running their own chess.com events 
and basically saying like, well, to some extent we can do whatever we want. We're going to try and like do a good job of it. And the players are like, well, great. You know, I mean, chess.com just running good events, giving us money and whatever. It's okay. Um, and now, you know, there's more on the line. There's more parties involved, you know, different stakeholders who want different things out of it. And so it's, it's got to be a little bit more clearly elaborated maybe. That said, like, I often fall a little bit on the side of like, well, do something that's like reasonable, so to speak. So, um, you know, like somebody's asking, it's very strange that they asked to have the exact position. Like Armenia wanted to restart from the position in their game, even though they could have had time to like discuss the position or look on like computer engines or whatever, right? Um, versus why not just restart the game or restart the match or something like that, right? I think from the Armenian perspective, it's probably because the final position was basically like king and pawn versus king. Like if Kostya and I had a game where I had a king and like a pawn on e4 and he had a king on e6, um, I wouldn't be like, oh, Kostya is going to like go have stockfish, like show him how to draw this position, right? Like right. I would just be like, okay, he disconnected in like a position that's obvious. I agree to a draw. Um, so... I think that might be why the Armenians uh, appealed for the same position, basically. I think to them it was probably... Because they're all GMs. So you have to understand their like perspective on positions is a little bit different than ours. They're all GMs. To them, it was basically like king and pawn against king. It was like black puts the bishop on f5 and sits. Um, so I think that could like explain partly why they looked at it that way. Yeah, I mean... I feel like we should have the discussion separate about like the position because like of course like if a position is a fortress and a GM knows how to hold it like of course they're going to hold it and, and like I believe that they will as long as they don't disconnect um, but there there are going to be gray areas where it's like holdable for instance like yeah. rook and two pawns versus rook and one pawn I definitely expect GMs to hold that in most cases but they're not going to hold it 100% of the time so it's right. like the very player with two pawns has like a one percent that they're playing for. Yeah, which is very legitimate, especially with low time. Um, but then it's like, yeah, they win only because the opponent flagged. It doesn't feel like they actually won the game. It feels like they won on a uh, technicality. Yeah. Um. So for me, I feel like the most natural solution is to when something like this happens and it. So chess.com, I mean, they they made the ruling uh, along with FIDE. So they, they've had FIDE step in with like an appeals committee because this is like the FIDE online Olympiad, which I think makes a lot of sense to not put all the pressure on chess.com to like run the event and ensure like fair play because uh, there should be some kind of like checks and balances and stuff. Um, so they ruled that it was Armenia's fault in terms of the disconnection. Yeah. But I don't get the real drawback to just letting the players play the game because it sounds like he was able to reconnect mm -hmm. uh fairly quickly uh we'll get to the india thing where i think they just have like a huge outage and that might have been a much bigger issue yeah um so if he's able to reconnect in like two minutes obviously the fans want to see the game play out the fans don't want the game adjudicated uh can we give the players the benefit of the doubt that they're not going to be like discussing the position like while they're i guess waiting for the game to to reconnect i mean i would say yes i mean cheat detection is in place anyway right people are worried that like aronian's gonna talk to him about the end game or that he's gonna like go on an engine but like he's still connected to the zoom call like you still have all your cheat detection in place right like you can still see that he's just sitting there i, I mean i think that would really cinch it for me if they were still connected and they're like all, all on audio and people would be able to hear them if they start like discussing the position. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking even if they were totally disconnected from Zoom as well and theoretically could cheat without anyone finding out. I mean, I think like that's very unfortunate, but I don't know. Actually, now <laughs> the more I think about it, it's like not a perfect solution. Like, because uh, I mean, these are all professional players. So we don't expect them to cheat most of the time, but some of them will. And then we're also going to have situations with non-professionals that like could be more likely to to cheat in a similar case. Like we definitely don't want to allow for the possibility where someone disconnects their internet, claims that it's not their fault, cheats, comes back, and then plays the game out right and, and wins. Like that that can't be uh, 
enabled in any way. Right. But I think when it's like between professionals, then like, yeah, they were still on the Zoom call. I think you just replay the game. Uh, I mean, replay the game from the position. Um, or if one side is really indignant, you just replay the game. From the and start. Get, yeah, from the start, yeah. Yeah, it's not the end of the world to replay from the start either. Like for the person who's been disconnected, you may say like, hey, I already played this game out. I shouldn't have to play it again. But you did get disconnected. So if like you're obliged to replay the game, that seems like much better than being forfeited. So like I would say you still yeah. accept it and say you're like, no okay. To make demands. The tricky thing is, well, what do we do if the Indian player was winning on the board? Let's say it's not 100% he's winning, but he has a big advantage. Then it's very unfair to him to restart the game on a right. disconnection. Right. But then he should have the choice to say, like, yeah, let's restart from the position we had. Right. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, I mean, still not ideal. Technically, the other the player who got disconnected could cheat. But, um, I mean, I don't hate, I definitely don't hate the decision that they made in terms of just holding the, the, the forfeit. I would have preferred that they just replayed the game in some sense, but... Right. Uh, I definitely don't blame chess.com for uh, uh, just sticking to that. Right. The other thing I would say is in all these cases, like you should first ask both parties what they agree to before you enforce some kind of rule on them. Because in many cases, both parties will have good sportsmanship. They'll just agree to something. Then you know that you have something that both parties agreed to. You haven't had to like take a position or make a decision either. So like no one can really be that mad at you. And then you move on. Um, yeah, actually, I think that's a really great point. Right? Like, you it's, ask the team captain possible. of India yeah. and the team captain of Armenia to talk together for a minute. And if they've got a 60-second solution that they're both in agreement on, boom, you're done. Easy, you know? Because, like, think of the Magnus Carlsen thing, right, where Dingley Ren got disconnected in an endgame where he defended all game and had managed to draw a bad rook endgame against Magnus, but it wasn't completely done yet, right? I mean, Magnus could have still maybe beaten us from that position. He could have kept trying, mm -hmm. right? But he felt like yeah. Dingley Ren would have gotten the draw. Dingley Ren gets disconnected. What do the rules say? The rules say D Dingley Ren loses, but what does Carlson think? He thinks that it should have been declared a draw. So the next game, he just resigns to make the score even again, right? That's yeah, basically that was that, uh, queen g5 game, right? Queen g5 to d2 check. Oops, I resign, right? So mm -hmm. that is an example of the two players could have agreed, right? Like Carlson and Dingley Ren could have just talked and said, we agree that the game was a draw. If they'd wanted to, right? If, if, the, if the arbiters asked them. That's basically what Carlson did by giving the other game back. That is sportsmanship, and I think very often, if you have players at this level, you know, basically the captains are Vidit and Levon, right? Mm -hmm. What are the chances that in a civil Zoom call for two minutes, Vidit and Levon could have worked something out that they were both okay with, so to speak? I mean, I don't know. Maybe they, maybe they were contacted. Maybe they, yeah. Maybe, maybe they were and maybe they couldn't. Like, but yeah. I would say that would definitely be my first step, actually, in any process. Is like if both parties can agree on something, let's just go. Yeah. No, I think that is that is really important. Uh, Vishnu brings up a good point that team battles are always tricky. And I definitely sympathize with that. Because for me personally, yeah, I want the thing to be decided on the board. I don't want to win in some kind of technical fashion. I'd rather just play out the game, even if I feel like I have the right to claim a win or something. But if yeah. I have three teammates that are also depending on me, then I do have to consider their feelings because they, a lot of times they don't care how I win. Like <laughs> if, if my opponent just like disconnects and, and that's how they, you know, I end up winning my game. Like, okay, maybe they also have similar feelings of sportsmanship, but if you've played on a team, you kind of don't really care how you get the win. It's just important that everyone is, is happy. So it's tough yeah. when, um, yeah, you have other players uh, relying on you. Uh, and you don't want to you want to be fair to your opponent but you also want to be fair to your team uh, as well right uh, yeah so that's what i would start with um and then from there yeah <laughs> then ultimately if they if, if the team captains can't agree then you have to move to some kind of decision and uh i mean ultimately i think it really sucked for armenia like i can only feel bad for them with the result like i can't feel like that was a good or fair result um what happened next obviously the match was still there was still a second round to go and the armenians could have come back since they were only down one point um 
and uh, the Armenians refused to play. So that's the second part of the controversy, right? Yeah. They said, if you reject our appeal, like we won't continue to participate. Um, as usual, you know, FIDE always thinks they're more important than like their players and that, you know, the players need them more than they need players. So they're like, whatever. So they forfeit <laughs> all of them for the match. Uh, again, seems like a stupid decision. At some point, like you got to listen to the actual chess players instead of just, just being dumb politicians all the time. But I mean, once they've, um, you know, once they've made the decision, if Armenia decides to give them an ultimatum, I mean, can they really just change their mind? Like, I mean, obviously they never do, like but they should. Yes. Here's the thing. Like FIDE has a long track record of being wrong about things. So when people tell them that they're wrong, they should be like, oh yeah, we're probably wrong. And then be open to changing their minds. Oh, I, I definitely agree with that. I just mean, in, in this case, like, whatever decision they made, Armenia is was going to be upset. Uh, and I just, I mean, I, like, let's say FIDE was in the right, whatever decision they make, then, like, uh, I mean, they can't just change their mind because a team threatens to quit. I suppose you might be right, but that's a false hypothetical because you said, what if FIDE were right about a decision? Well, in an ideal world, they are making good decisions, <laughs> and the teams mm -hmm. aren't always going to be happy about those, but... In an ideal world, FIDE is making a very like fair and equitable decision as much as they can. Sometimes players will um, strike anyway. Okay, if FIDE were making good decisions, you'd probably get a lot. <laughs> you'd probably get a lot less players being upset about the decisions. I mean, this whole scenario would. I mean, I just, it's hard for me to imagine a scenario where FIDE makes correct decisions and then f players get upset about it wrongly anyway. But I just mean uh, that you. You can't have a process where you decide an appeal and then overturn based on one of the teams complaining. You know, it's like I mean, you could choose. You could say like, oh, if they mean it that much, like it's worth it to us to have the match played rather than to just like be stubborn. Uh, no, but then that just opens up for for everyone to just sure strike all the time. Which I'm I I'm be... I'm for that. General strikes all the time, sure. <laughs> but then any any small controversy, I mean, we would have a just the player would quit, you know, like anyone like but like the, the match with like Nepo and Naka where Naka like castled with two hands and then didn't get called for it, and so Nepo quits. Like, you know what, if you're not gonna call I quit the match. Like we can't just Right, have, but like, do you but do you really think that like over more and more silly little things, like serious players are gonna just threaten to quit again and again? I think it's very rare to have something like the entire Armenian team unified protesting like that. I think that protest raises a flag. It's like, wow, you know, this many people actually believe and care in something enough together. I don't think that happens every time. No, it, it doesn't. But I just, I have sympathy for this idea of like, once you've made a public decision, you do have to stick with it unless like new evidence comes out or like you can't just bend to some kind of like, you know, I would call it like an emotional argument saying like, this is unfair. So like, like, cause obviously they, they made that argument during the appeals process. They, they of course took Armenia's point of view into their decision. I don't think they made the right decision just to be clear, but I do understand like once they've made that decision, they can't just, they can't just keep overturning things. Like no one would respect anything they say then. Cause like, well, I mean, nobody there's... already does respect anything they say. So that's not something to lose. <laughs> I, I really think that you can, you can be flexible instead of saying like, I need to maintain my respect by being like stubborn that like, I never change anything that I say. I think it's better to say like, well, I think I was right about this decision, but I'm not willing to have the whole Armenian team forfeit. I'd rather have the match played on. So I'm changing my decision. But, but what if and that ends up to the Indian team quitting? Cause they're like, well, we just, we feel like we deserve the point. And now you're giving it to Armenia right. just because they made us think. So we're going to make us think. Then too. I say, I guess no teams want to play. We end the competition without a winner. <laughs> so, you go from you go from bending over backwards to help one team to just ending the competition. Well, I mean, I would let you know the U.S. and Russia play the championship match in their semifinal. But why wouldn't the same logic apply to the Indian team if they're if they feel wronged? by the decision well because to... because if i can't get both teams to sit down then i i don't don't have a good option anymore 
but I think that might have that might have been what happened. I, I I don't know what, what, what like the details, unfortunately. Like, um, yeah. I have no idea what India was saying, but maybe they were like claiming they should be winning the the match. I, I honestly just don't know. And to be clear, I think like a major flaw in your argument is the idea that it opens like a can of worms that once one player every does something everybody's going to do it you know i really don't think that like i, I really don't believe don't believe in general these arguments where like oh if you do something then there's like an incentive for like everybody to cheat or there's an incentive for everybody to lie or an incentive for everybody to like blah 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 because i think most people you know if we're talking chess actually want to play like in chess matches and if you're talking like in in normal life, you know, most people really want to like, you know, work and stuff like that. So I think all those things where it's like, oh, if you make this incentive, everybody's going to run all over and take advantage of it. I don't, I think those arguments are generally wrong. Like people are going to continue behaving the way they did before for the most part. And I think, you know, the Armenians wanted to play chess and the Indians wanted to play chess. And I think generally you'll, you'll find solutions and you won't find a bunch of people just like trying to get, you know water brought to their table or they leave the tournament yeah no i'm, I'm definitely with you there honestly we have the opposite problem where like a fide it. official kicked someone out of a tournament for like not wearing the pants that he wanted him to wear or something like that right it's like absolutely the opposite right now it's that like the chess players generally are reasonable and the people making rules about them are just completely out of their minds i i Definitely don't disagree there. I think, there, yeah, the rules can be very strict. Yeah, that Kovalov situation was just, like, hilariously uh, ridiculous. Yeah, um, and never reinstated. Or, like, Rajabov, who should be in the candidates tournament, the only person who was right about it. My solution to that is he's the challenger because he saw more moves ahead of everybody else and everyone <laughs> else made the wrong decision. I disqualified the other nine people. Sorry. Wrong decision. Good try, guys. But, um, you know, Rajabov is the only one who assess the position correctly and i would instate him as the challenger and uh um, no, that's not what vishnu said schedule uh, the match <laughs> or sorry that's not what david said vishnu <laughs> he's not saying he should be in the candidates he's saying just give it to him <laughs> yeah if they want to replay the candidates then they have to restart from zero with raj above playing and i'm okay with that too um, but yeah, if they're going to disqualify anybody it should be everybody except for raj above right no I, I think it actually was a similar situation because um well, you know, going to today's controversy, uh, India is the one that, or their team is the one that disconnected. Shall I advance to topic 1B? Uh, well, actually, no, I want to do a quick no. poll on this one just oh, while, yeah. maybe cool. while we introduce the next one. Um, I think we agree that the game should have been replayed in some sense, right? Yeah. Um, so what I'll do for the poll is um, I'll ask... Um, you could What's give a few the, options, like what yeah. should the decision have been? And then you could give like game replayed from the current position, game replayed from the start, uh, Armenia loses the game. Right. So we can say restart the game or replay the game. Start the game. Armenia forfeits. Is there a fourth option? I don't think so. Three choices. So actually, it's because the problem with our polls, sometimes they're just a very obvious winner because through our discussion, we end up coming through some kind of like equilibrium. But um, with three three choices, it won't be so easy. Yeah, Charlie gives a good point. I think like the game, the team that didn't disconnect should actually probably have the choice between those options. Um, but anyway, let's just see what people prefer. We can only make our poll so perfect and, and granular. The uh, the position waffle trek was that the Indian player was pressing, but the Armenian player had a fortress uh, and would likely hold if the game was just played out under normal circumstances. Fide Trainer, so far we haven't disagreed too much in previous episodes. Not tons. 
We'll, I mean, we'll see. We've had a few disagreements. Yeah. We disagreed on, like, Naka's chances against Carlson. That's a big one. Um, when I used to do this show with Danny 10 years ago, we would almost always disagree because I would say something, like, reasonable, as usual. <laughs> And then Danny would just say something absolutely ludicrous to like make it a big like controversy. But we actually, for this, Kosti and I don't discuss like our opinions in advance. Um, and so we don't know if we're going to agree or disagree. We try to come up with topics that are interesting enough that it's like possible we would disagree, but we don't like force it. If we agree, we agree. Yeah, yeah, which I think is uh Right. We don't want to just be like Fox News, just yelling at each other. I mean, we can if that's what you guys want. We'll do it, but we don't want that. No. All right. Wow, look at this. Our first tie. Six votes each. Replay the game position or just restart the game. And how much did the forfeit get? Only half as many. Three. Three votes. Oh, three. Six, six, three. Okay. <laughs> cool. All right. On we go then. Thoughts on the Russia India controversy, Kostya? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so then we come to today, and this story developed, yeah, like while I was doing the, the Coach S show. So I, I was just like, or, I mean, I saw it this morning, and then it was, like, developing as... Um... So, yeah, I mean, if you guys haven't... Don't know what's going on. Basically, it, it, today, India and Russia played a match. Um, their first match was drawn. Uh, they, they were going to play two matches. Their second match, Russia was leading by one point uh, with two games to go. I think, like, the junior board and uh, the women's board. Uh, I saw on Twitter, I actually didn't check out the positions, but someone was saying that uh, India was winning on one of the boards and the other board was likely a draw. I don't know if that's true. That's just what I've seen I the positions. Heard. They're from the opening. I can. Oh, I, from I've, the opening. I've studied the positions a little bit. They're like they're like at the border between the opening and the middle game. Like the opening's done and the middle game's about to start. Oh, so they're both just the, like all the play is left. Yeah. But in one of them, one player was already winning. But all the pieces were still on the board. Oh, I see, I see. And so there's one match. other game that was disconnected also, which was the game, which was, um, which was a game where the Indian player managed to reconnect and then eventually lost. That's the only game the Russians won. It was a game where the Russians had the advantage, but how much time trouble slash disconnection being upsetting played into that loss, who knows, right? Very, very hard to say. That was the game that Humpy lost to Goryachkina. Mm -hmm. And so, well, basically what I understand happened is that there was a global internet outage, not just in India, if I'm, if I'm correct. Uh, and so that caused the Indian team to disconnect. And uh, so this one's pretty clearly, there's no question it's not their fault. I mean, there's probably nothing they could have done like to avoid this more or less yeah um short of going to like a different country maybe i, I don't even know uh how it works maybe if if you can get like a portable internet out there that might be a solution but i just don't know so that one was a tough one and they uh, went to the appeals committee uh which had two members uh for some reason no it it has three members officially but one of the members is dvorkovich who had to step aside because he's affiliated with the Russian team. <laughs> um, he, I feel like, should have been replaced because the appeals committee ends up having two members. They can't come to a decision on what to do. Oops. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then it turns out the decision goes to Dvorkovich, who, as a FIDE president, needs to step in and make a decision in case of a split jury or a hung jury or a hung appeals committee. Uh, decides to do the kind of equitable thing or equanimous thing, whatever you want to call it, uh, to give both Russia and India the gold medal. Uh huh. Um, which obviously, yeah, stirred up some controversy uh, because, well, Russia was leading the match. Had India, let's say India 
tied the match, like the games had kind of gone the way, let's say we expect them to, then the match would have been tied and then they just play like a tie break and, you know, whoever would win would win. Right. Um, so it did feel like Russia is like kind of the, well, uh, hold on. I don't want to give my opinions. Yeah. Those are just the facts of the situation, right? Are there any okay. that I missed? No, that's, that's fair. You can give us your thoughts. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, there's also a lot of players uh, expressing their opinions. Most Indian players were pretty happy. Um, some of the Russian players expressed disdain that they both got gold medals because they felt right. like Russia was the deserving winner. Right. Uh, and if the case had been judged the way the India Armenian case had been judged, then India would have just been forfeited and Russia would be the uh, the gold medalist. I would think the saltiest of all would have been the Armenians who weren't in this match today, but like <laughs> Yeah, the Rajab of, of the situation, the Armenians. <laughs> yes. <laughs> who were just kicked to a side and then one day later all of a sudden it's like, Oh yeah, COVID is serious, so we're gonna postpone the event. <laughs> yeah. Um well, I saw Kostenyuk posted a very salty tweet yep. about how the Indians aren't deserving champions. Uh, I saw Nepo as well post something that was pretty funny. Um, yep. I forget what it was exactly, but it was it was very biting, I assure you guys. Uh, I have it. I have it still up here. And uh, what he tweeted was, Smart decision to please Indian chess community, meanwhile forgetting about other fans and players. Selective nobleness from FIDE chess. And that's actually kind of in the background as well. It should be mentioned that like the Indian team has just a lot more fans in terms of quantity and can make much louder noise online than Armenian fans can, uh, even though Armenia was very vocally upset about yeah. their decision. In this case, I think Levon's tweet was even more clever. His tweet was, I guess, like always, some of us are less disconnected than others. And he says 1984, but it's actually a reference to Animal Farm, same author, mm. Orwell, in which it says, you know, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others, right? So everyone gets disconnected, but some are less disconnected than the others. The Indians can still win the championship while disconnected, is his point. That's pretty poignant. Yeah. All right, Dave, why don't you go first on this one? What do you think? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't understand why they couldn't um, just sort of like postpone and replay that's that's what i would go for if i think this is not like a two minute internet outage so it may not have been like convenient to like replay it right now right. but i think they could you know schedule to replay the three the the remaining games um i would probably let the win stand in the game with Koneru. Um, unless again, I would go to the captains of the Russian and, and Indian teams and ask them what they thought. But if they thought that that win should stand, then I would also tend to think that. And then the other two games should probably be replayed. Um, from the, and the side that, the side that like didn't get disconnected gets to choose whether they want to start it completely over or start from the position they had. They have to make the same decision for both games. Um, which, which captain of which team would I give more weight to? <laughs> Neither. It's just, I would first give the captains an option to agree together is my point, Krishna, which is the comment I made on the previous controversy from the day before with Armenia and India as well, that if the captains of the two teams can agree on something that they feel both of them can live with and keeps like sportsmanship intact, then I would love to do that instead of having an official come in with a decision. So I would always allow the participants themselves first. But if they don't, the decision that I would reach is to have those two games replayed. Um, and then after that, uh, yeah, if the match is tied, then go to uh, the Armageddon thing as, as, as usual. Okay. Well, I think, um, so one, I guess, important detail, although I don't feel, I feel like the decision should be made almost like, not counting again the the chess positions on the board but right india was the one that was kind of leading in the the last two games they had an equal position and a better position yeah they're also the ones that disconnected yeah so it is kind of equitable to say just restart the games like okay you guys had an edge in this game so that's unfair to you to restart it but at the same time like you are the ones that disconnected so it's right. kind of unlucky it's not your fault but it is what it is. If it's anyone's fault, it's the Indian team. It's definitely not the Russian team's fault. Um, yeah. So 
that seems like kind of a fair fair trait to me i just like replay the the two games that to me does seem like the main question too is like why why can't they just play tomorrow or in a week i mean for the u.s amateur team tournament where there's like an east winner and a west winner and a north winner and a south winner it takes months to, to organize a final because all four teams have to play online but they they do it and that's a much less important tournament than the olympiad uh, as important as the u.s amateur team is so they find a way to just schedule it online for a date that works for for everyone and i'm sure they could have done it here no one else is doing anything in the real world as far as chess it's all online anyways um so, well, good question from Vishnu. What if those two boards were much worse for India? Yeah, I mean, that would Russia suck, that would suck for them, but basically they'd be getting the chance to keep playing versus just being forfeited. So I think they could still accept it. I think the team that doesn't get disconnected, their captain gets to choose whether to restart um, or from the positions or the games completely. And whether they're better or worse, either way, that choice is some advantage to them to get to make that choice. They can make it from a sporting perspective or they can make it from a sportsmanship perspective, you know, like they can try to maximize their team's chances of winning or they can try and do what they think is most just, you know, and if they think we're really losing this game, then, you know, if I were the captain, I would say, OK, well, you know, we'll still give them their chance to win this game. But, um, yeah, if you replay the position, even if you're Russia and you have an advantage on both boards, I mean, uh, it's never ideal to like a journey game because that just opens up cheating again. Yeah. Even if you're better and like you can also look at the position, I don't think that's like what Russia would be thinking about like, well, we can also cheat <laughs> and so if we if we have a good position, we should be able to like figure out how to keep the advantage. Right. Um but also I think making bad decisions in order to avoid the possibility of something bad happening, it's like you forfeited someone to make sure that they didn't, you know, maybe cheat, right? Like, wh why do you think they were going to cheat, you know? I. Well, it's not that you think they are going to cheat. It's just that. I know you um, want to protect, like, integrity and, like, give people the yeah. expectation that they don't have to worry about whether or not other people are cheating. But I still think if you've got a choice between doing something wrong or allowing the possibility that something wrong might happen, but it's only a possibility you're still better off going down that kind of a road. Uh, I think like I'm going to forfeit right. you in advance to make sure that you don't maybe cheat. Like well, it's not a better like, decision. It's, I think it's just like, it's one of those things where like if you have, if you have two kids and you have one piece of candy, either one pe one kid gets candy and the other one doesn't, Mm -hmm. or no one gets any candy and that's fair and that situation is kind of worse it's like no one is getting candy but mm -hmm. at least it's fair to the kids so they feel like that's equal right um so it's like it has to be a matter of at least like the perception of of fairness and that like everything is um legit right <laughs> candy is bad for kids. and similarly i would give the kids a chance to see if they can come up with a solution that makes them both happy right if they're willing to have like one kid lick it for like five minutes and then pass it to the other <laughs> okay yeah that's fine with you as an adult you're okay you just let them <laughs> yeah make their choice <laughs> hmm. um all right so question if you replay india and russia shouldn't you also replay armenia and india well i, I think we do want to replay armenia and india yeah yeah, we did. Um, yeah. So. Um, right. It's kind of a bummer overall. I definitely don't like the decision to just give them both gold medals. I, I just don't understand why that had to come so quickly. Like, can't you try to schedule? Well, maybe they just, maybe that was their reasoning. It was just like, they they don't they can't find the possibility that doesn't allow for like potential cheating or per perception that there could be cheating they just can't find something that isn't 100 percent fair and so a match was close enough both sides get gold medals uh which to me just feels like yeah it's anti-sporting and it doesn't really leave a great like taste in in your mouth about the event uh because it just feels like there wasn't uh, a true winner yeah. Um, I, mean, I mean, I really love the, the Indian team, but like, it does feel like they kind of, uh, 
got like a little bit of an edge here, to be honest, just because they were losing the match at the time that they disconnected, and then they end up getting like the gold medals. Like, definitely doesn't seem all that uh, fair. Yeah, I mean that said, like I even worry less about that than that. I just, I mean, well, sorry. Let me put it this way: I don't care too much about the Indians also getting like a medal. I just I would like to see like games finished and things like played out and like decided over the board in general. Like I don't know why like Russians for example would be like really mad that like Indians also got the gold medal. You still got the gold medal. Nothing was really taken away from you. Like to me like I don't quite understand why the Russians were so <laughs> mad about it. <laughs> it's like you just yeah. won the Olympiad and you're pissed, right? You're like on Twitter like whining when you just won. Um yeah, I mean, no, 100%, like, I'm with you there. Like, that's the weird Russian. to me, but as a fan, I like to see all the games get played and played out, you know, so. No, absolutely. That's what's I, missing to me a little bit. I'd like to see the games finished. I just feel like they lost, like, all, like, all public favor when they when they got salty. Like, they could have just said, like, unfortunate that the match couldn't finish. Yeah. We'd like to congratulate the Indians on like an amazing Olympiad. Right. And like we're really proud to have won the gold medals. And just don't say the quiet part. Like obviously all the fans know that like Russia was leading the match at the time of disconnection. Everyone can understand they're kind of like the moral winners of the match. But you don't have to say that as the winner. That's just like bad sportsmanship. Like if you get first place, you don't just get up there and say like, yeah, I deserve this. <laughs> like Everyone else sucks. Like, you know, you, you got to be a little bit humble. Yeah, I mean, just say like it was like it was like a fun event. It was exciting, like you know, or 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 it wasn't a fun event, and you hope that they'll do some other format next time and say your proposal. You know, just I mean, there's no there's no need. Yeah, and and Vertwitch asking what the chess queen posted. I mean, she said, let's clarify one thing: India didn't win the Olympiad, but was that rather named by Fide a co-champion? The same thing applies to you dog i mean you didn't win the olympiad either the games weren't finished you were also named a co-champion by fide in my humble opinion <laughs> which chess player actually has a humble opinion but in my humble opinion there's a huge difference between actually winning the gold or just being awarded one without winning a single game i mean essentially the same could be said about you you didn't actually win the gold you were just awarded it you know you guys won one game maybe against an opponent who was disconnected and put into time pressure you know, one game out of 12, you know? So, I, I think her tweet's stupid. That's what I think of it. Yeah, no, I, I think, like, it, it just reads as very uh, salty. Um, and it's like, I mean, even if it's 100% correct, even if Dvorkovic was, like, only made the decision for marketing reasons, he's just like, I'm going to give the Indians the gold medal because there's a lot of fans in India there's a lot of money. I want to keep them happy and like grow chess that way. Yeah. I think as the Russians, like you still just like, it just looks bad. Just like keep your mouth shut and like take your gold medal. Yeah. I or I mean, if this is what you really think, then fine. Let us all know what idiots you are, I guess. Sure. <laughs> it's fine. I don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Onwards. Well, time for a poll. Time for a poll. <laughs> um, and so how many we... of our topics are we getting to today, Coast? <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. I'm I'm down to stick around for for a little bit though. Like, all right. You, you call it when you want to another, though. Another few topics. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, okay, we got a lot of topics left, folks. <laughs> <laughs> um. Here we go and and okay look they could be upset too but like this tweet is just stupid is really my point like you could be upset you could be like you could post a tweet saying i'm really upset i thought we would have won the match i would have liked to play it out right i could post that coast yeah then you wouldn't call me an idiot right if you posted what exactly if i posted a tweet saying really disappointed like like i'm really upset i wanted to play the match out and i think we would have won i think we'd have probably won it you know really disappointed I could post that. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Right, that would be honest total... to my feelings, but I wouldn't come yeah. across as a moron. Right. It's totally legitimate to feel frustrated. Right. I think that's the, that's the point. Uh, but, yeah, it, it takes it too far when you, like, try to take away something from someone else that just, like, 
Yeah, like it just India having gold medals doesn't take Russia's gold medals. Russia no. also gets gold medals. So why do you have to like <laughs> claw at that? I don't know. It just uh Yeah. And the lack of logic, right? Like Yeah, I think like they're gonna look at it in like a week even and be like, Wow, that was really petty. And be like, What was the huge difference I was referring to between us being in the same situation? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the huge difference would be between how Armenia was treated, but not between, like, how Russia and India were treated since they were each given the co-championships. Okay. To be fair, though, I think that's also in the background, <laughs> the fact that, like, the decision in the two cases was different and that basically India benefited from both decisions. Yeah. I get that that is unpleasant, but to me, the situations were quite different in terms of one player disconnecting. It's not really clear if it's their fault or not. Although I still think they should have replayed that game, and this thing with like the entire team being forced to to disconnect. Yeah, and I guess I'll say I'll say this too. I'm gonna like I did call these tweets stupid, but like I'm sure I've tweeted something stupid at some point, right? Oh, I just yeah, don't yeah. tweet something stupid every day, like you know a world leader would. So I think. I think I can excuse them for it, right? I'm going to call their tweets stupid, but I'm going to excuse them for it. Like, for whatever reason, they were upset. I can't imagine why I wouldn't really have been that upset if I were a Russian player. I would have been upset if I were Levon. <laughs> but as a Russian player, I would not have been that upset. But they're upset, whatever. They, they're, they're feeling angry, and they didn't express it, like, super intelligently. That's life. I mean, they're rated 2,500 and 2,780, respectively. I'm sure that Jan and... and Alexandra are reasonably smart people and they just said something dumb because they were upset and I excuse them for it. No big deal. Yeah. Uh, Krishna's saying in the chat that maybe they're also being like harassed online by, by fans of the Indian team and that could have played in and which I totally understand if you're on Twitter and you're getting anonymous accounts constantly tweeting at you, like, I, I mean, I don't know what, what they're saying to them, but I, I've been on Twitter and people are rude. So I, I can, I can definitely sympathize with wanting to uh, to no, punch back. Um, but the issue is that you know you're hurting, you end up hurting the Indian players in their team that you probably really respect if you're Kastanik or Nepo. No. Nepo. When like okay, you're trying to hit back at these like dumb anonymous fans, but there's lots of ways to do that. The best way to hit back at them is to just ignore and block them. <laughs> it's like then they really can't uh, can't get to you. All right, sorry. I'm sure you said something great that i oh, yeah. agreed with you want to see the next topic <laughs> uh yeah let's do it so it looks like uh majority voted to just replay the critical games no one deserves to win all right on we go what's up with su oops chess fans wow kosia you really uh were angry when you <laughs> typed up this topic for us i didn't even know this was here <laughs> well, <laughs> well then who gave us this topic uh certainly not me although i have talked about this this is an issue in chess okay fine this is my topic <laughs> <laughs> which you've already just started talking about right because somebody asked about you know well maybe part of the russians like being so upset was that they were getting harassed online by fans yeah yeah which i would definitely sympathize with um well i think it's an issue with uh just the internet in general like it's just it, if you're allowed to be anonymous online like you know your your filter just goes out the window um i mean i don't know i i remember when i was like that and i feel like i matured out of it so when i, when I was a kid i remember that was the most fun thing in the world you just you go online some random website you'd be a troll people go crazy it's so much fun but like <laughs> now people are doing it to like real people on twitter <laughs> it's like but it was always to real people it was to real people, but it would be on like, you know, Yahoo billiards or something random. It was like, <laughs> it was just, you know, it's not like, uh, nowadays it's like, uh, it's like chess fans interacting with like real chess players. And like, I mean, in some cases, like even sending them like very like hurtful insults, uh, menacing threats, menacing words. I mean, and it's adults too. I have to, I mean, we have to distinguish between like a child doing something on the internet and like adults yeah. who think that they're being righteous. Um, yeah. Well, in this case, I mean, one thing I'll say is I don't think they were bots. I think these were real people like posting their comments um, on Twitter. And I saw like hundreds of comments of people like 
when Levon was upset yesterday, like posting like Levon, I used to be a fan of your chest. Now I see that you're just a sore loser and like, exactly. you know, I'm blocking you and never rooting for you again. You know, <laughs> just like, oh no, you just got blocked by, you know, some guy you've never heard of. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, I, I think, uh, I mean, again, I think it's just a problem in uh, all over the internet, um, in chess, maybe more so than other industries. I'm not really sure. I feel like gaming has like similar issues and all kinds of other um, communities as well. Um, what to do? I don't know. I think the best thing is basically to just ignore people that you think are being trolls or malicious. Mm -hmm. Um or even if they're not, like, the real gray area is like just the super fan who's not a troll. They don't think they're doing anything wrong. They're just defending their heroes. Right. Uh, I saw a lot of this in like the XQC Ben Feingold case. It was just like people were getting mad at Ben Feingold for saying mean things and then in reaction saying much meaner things to him. Right. <laughs> and, like, so are they actually against the saying of mean things or are they just fanatics? Right, right. Yeah. All right. Um, I want to yeah. give two examples of like some of the dumbest things I've I've seen in the past <laughs> week, Kostya, because this Olympiad has really brought it out. Now, often we say this is a good thing. It, it's it's clearly showing that there are a lot of more noobs coming to chess, right? Like our topic with Pog Champs last week. We're like, well, it's all these new players. That's great, right? So there's like a huge boom in like fans, um, especially I think watching the Indian team. Just a huge number of um, people there watching that team. It's a large populous country, right? Yeah. Um, so a huge number of new fans and normally that's like a great thing, right? But it also means you've got people who don't know the knight from the bishop who are giving like opinions on Levon Aronian, which can sometimes, if Levon takes it the wrong way, can be painful, I guess. But here are two things that happened to me this week, Kostya. Number one, I was commenting the Olympiad and I was analyzing the game of Hari Krishna. Yeah. Who, by the way, is somebody that I've met and is a wonderful, wonderful person. Okay, mm -hmm. super nice, generous, great player. I'm absolutely not unbiased about him. I'm a big fan of his. Sure. So I'm analyzing his game on the uh, official broadcast, and some fans start yelling at me like, hey, why won't you cover any games from the Indian team? You're so, like, biased against India. Like, show us some games from the Indian team. Come on. Yeah, typical, typical Tuesday of commentary. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's one example. Um, <laughs> Wait, next did example. You say they yelled at you while you were showing the Hare Krishna game? Yes, I was analyzing a Hare Krishna game on stream. <laughs> that's pretty funny. <laughs> while, you know, complimenting his play and his team. Do you know which team he was on? <laughs> anyway, so that was one. The second one was on Twitter today. You know, somebody was saying something sort of sarcastic back at what Kostenia had, like, said about, like, you know, without winning games or whatever, right? And they wrote back, well, well, yeah, of course, like, Russia deserved to win since you 6-0'd that first round, you know, and would have, like, 6-0'd the next round if not for disconnects, right? This was an Indian fan, like, sarcastically attacking her. It was a pretty good attack, but he got immediately savaged by another Indian fan who wrote back to him like, what do you mean 6-0? We drew those six games, you like, <laughs> you know, damn moron. We drew those six games, and we definitely wouldn't have lost that second round if the games hadn't been disconnected. So and, then, <laughs> and then the, the previous Indian fan writes back saying like, kid, I'm on your side. <laughs> I, was, I was using sarcasm, you know, because obviously the Russians didn't really like win many games against us, right? Yeah. So... In, and then the guy writes back this, Kostya. And by the way, the, the poster's name was something obviously Indian, right? Like Krishna Prasad in our chat, right? It was a name where, like, you would guess that the person who posted it was Indian, right? But the other guy writes back to him saying, like, Oh, shoot, sorry. I thought you were Russian at first. That's why, like, I hated on you. But now that I see you're Indian, cool. So, like, the guy's comment... Like, for some reason, he thinks the guy's Russian, so the same comment is like, oh, you hate, I hate you, you dumb idiot, right? And then he's like, oh, wait, you posted that, but you were Indian. You're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so that's two examples of what is blowing my mind. Um, you know, and for a moment this morning, I was frustrated reading through, like, hundreds of these posts, you know, because every now and then it's just like, 
sad to me that overall we people are so dumb that we like hurt each other and like stumble over ourselves and like yeah. you know like like if i yelled at you like costia you need to drink more often you know while you're like drinking and like got into a fight with you over it you know it's just like why why do we have to do that <laughs> it's just so disappointing to me i i totally agree yeah people are saying i mean it's like i mean it's just uh analogy for what's going on in like the political space which is true um and foos just makes a good point i mean nowadays people don't even have to be anonymous to be idiots to each other on facebook yeah uh, i totally totally get that um i mean what to do i mean i think the solution is usually like just trying to have uh empathy for the other side i mean usually people are thinking like oh why doesn't the other side just listen but i think the answer is often like well try to empathize with the other side doesn't mean you have to agree with them i think it just helps to at least see where they're coming from and if they're just being like a full-on troll then yeah i think the the solution is like ignore block i think that's you just ignore them and you block them until they realize that like yeah if they want to interact with people in a real space it can't be a troll yeah and in fairness to chess fans like in some of those examples i saw like 50% 50% of people posting things back saying like, like, Levon, I apologize for the rudeness of this other like, fan, like, you know, we still love you in India, whatever, like, we understand this could be like frustrating for you. So in fairness, I mean, there were lots of like, really smart and like, polite, you know, people who tried to apply like love or empathy to the situation for the people on both sides of the situation. Um, So that's, so that's, that's good, too. But I think we have some problem with like like super fanatics who are, you know, really low rated yet think that they know better than like super GMs, you know, because like they're so like they're so fanatical about their thing. They're like, you know, we would have won this game. We would have drawn this game. We would have won this game. We would. You know what I mean? Like they they're just so sure of how things would go. Yeah, it's the Dunning Kruger effect, right? You know, that uh, famous charts where. It correlates how much you know versus how much you think you know. And then when you first start out, if you know a little bit, then the curve is extremely steep. And so it feels like you know quite a bit. But then once you once you start learning a little bit more about your field, you slowly realize like, oh, how much you actually don't know. And your confidence level ends up going down despite you actually learning more about whatever it is. So I think that it's a big thing going on. Uh, <laughs> Krishna says, did you guys know that Hare Krishna was recently called... So Hare Krishna, who... Uh, is known as like the nicest guy in India is called an elitist and more recently a traitor. Jeez. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I wasn't trying to say he's the nicest guy in India. I haven't met everybody in India, but I've met him and he's super nice. I, I would be yeah, shocked. No, his, his reputation is out of, yeah. That is his reputation? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. 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 For that. Yeah. Many times. Yeah. So, I mean, basically like there's like some position like out of the opening, you know, everything's left to play, but an engine says plus two. And so somebody's like, we would have won this game, but like (laughs) you're still 600 and you don't know that there's like a game to be played between masters who make mistakes. Every piece is on the board. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Onwards. Let's do it. Onwards. Anyway, don't worry, fans. I don't hate you. I was just a little bit sad today. Whoa. It's not getting less controversial, Coast. <laughs> Actually, I have I have a good answer for this one. I was good, worried about you go. this topic because it's really hard to talk about without sounding dumb. Um, but I actually did this co-chess show. So the question is, why, why does the U.S. have less strong women players? And so I think we're basically referring to like the Olympia teams. The on the the open side, the top part. I think the U.S. competes with basically any country in the world at this point. Um, we can say that's because we've bought players, but we can get into that. Um, but when it comes to, uh, the women's side, our women's team isn't competitive exactly with like Russia, India, China, Georgia, Armenia, and and these teams that are getting medals like every Olympiad. So yeah, I didn't know what to say at first about this because I, I'm just not sure, but, um, I did the coach show today with, uh, Keddie uh, Sasalashvili from Georgia. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so she's a very strong player. And I actually asked her, I asked her a question about the Georgian chess school. It's like, I mean, Georgians are really strong. The country of Georgia, of course, they have some amazing players. I was just curious, like, how would she describe it? And then she started talking about the women's team. 
in Georgia and how they've been uh, incredibly successful and more successful than the Open team in terms of their Olympiad uh, performances. Yeah. Uh, the reason that Keddie gave was uh, because Georgia has a huge legacy with two women's world champions, Maya Chipperdanizi and uh, Nona Kaprindashvili, uh, very famous players, really strong grandmasters. And because they were two Georgian women world champions, they had this like boom in Georgia, similar to the way India had a boom with Anand, Carlson in Norway, and the U.S. with with Fisher. Yeah. Uh, so much so that apparently almost every girl born in Georgia during Nona and Maya's uh, time of reign was named either Nona or Maya, named after the world champions. Like those are the two most popular girls' names in a yeah, certain I, generation. I didn't get from Ketty exactly if they're like the two most popular or just extremely popular just, names yeah. for girls. But nice. yeah, basically a bunch of girls were named that because of the, the world champions. And so that led me thinking like, well, that might have something to do with it. Like now Georgia has an incredibly strong women's team. They have a bunch of good players. They're always meddling. Uh, they do have this like huge legacy of female players. And uh, well, when, when they're growing up in Georgia, chess is very competitive. You have a lot of boys and girls playing and the ones that are the most talented, the most, the hardest working, they end up getting support and becoming stronger, becoming title players and representing uh, the country. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like the U.S. doesn't have that. We have a couple of really good female players, and they definitely act like role models, like Irina Crush, Jen Shahadi, nowadays uh, Tadev, and, and Jennifer Yu, I'm sure, like are inspiring many, many girls within the U.S., and things might change, but clearly it hasn't been like the case in uh, other countries. Yeah. That's cool. So we just haven't had like a particular reason for a boom. So relatively speaking, there are several other countries that had a boom. Um. I can give uh, another example, which is China and Turkey each had a central federation that wanted to set out to achieve, you know, some kind of international recognition for their chess teams. And China and Turkey each looked at the landscape and thought it would be easier for us to try to train up two to three 2,500 rated women than to try to train up two to three 2,700 rated men. And that was kind of like a strategic decision taken in their federations at two different points in time you know china like maybe 20 to 30 years ago and and turkey like 15 years ago hmm. um and so those are two countries which deliberately invested in female players more than male players um so that that's like another example whereas the u.s if you look at where it has invested um it has not particularly invested in female players um, yeah, not that I know of. Right? No, like, special program for that. Um, we had, like, a Kasparov chess thing where he was training, like, a couple of the top juniors now and then that happened. That was, you know, the top juniors overall, thus guys. And he didn't do, like, a separate section for the best, you know, girls under 12 or 14 or whatever group he was looking at. So I think that's another thing that would allow, that would explain a couple other countries that might be ahead of us on their women's team compared to their men's team. Um, and then you also have the effect in the U.S. of the importation of some top players. Right. I don't know why the U.S. hasn't been an attractive destination for, you know, 2,500 rated women from other countries to emigrate, but it has been an attractive destination for 2,650 to 2,750 um, male GMs to emigrate. So yeah, I think that has a big curious. effect on it as well. Right. I mean, I know there were there were some really strong female players that went to school here. I think one of the Kosen Seva sisters from Russia went to school uh, in like Texas. So yeah, it's interesting that we haven't had the same influx like like we had, like we got Wesley So, we got Caruana, we got Dominguez, um, like all these players, uh, not to mention, yeah, the 2700s, the 2650s that went to school here and then ended up like switching their federations. Yeah. Um, so we could say that like the open section is a little bit inflated because of these like acquisitions in terms of players that were purely like homegrown within the US uh, I would say it's probably a little bit closer in terms of like their relative strength. I'll be right back. Sure. <laughs> Did I say we got Caruana? Well, yeah, I mean, he, he switched his federation at a time when he was a top player. Uh, 
I mean, presumably for financial incentive, yeah, from, from Italy to, to the U.S. Um, I think he was very much, you know, convinced <laughs> by someone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I remember that, that joke that Magnus made. So, yeah, so that happened after, I think after Wesley had already switched, or Wesley and, and Fabi, they switched somewhere around the same time. I forgot who did it uh, first. Um, Laurent made a good point earlier. I want to scroll up. Um, yeah, it's also a question of numbers in the youth and organization to support female players to become pros. I think that's a big point as well. Um, now, most most chess programs that I've worked for, they don't really differentiate much between boys and girls. Like, they just want everyone to play chess. And uh, actually, a lot of classes do have a lot of girls, so it's not like a matter of numbers. But usually what happens is, like, more boys get interested and more boys end up playing in, like, tournaments and sticking with it. And then we get these, like, huge discrepancies where it's, like, 90%, 95% uh, men in, in tournaments. Um, and of course that is going to lead to just having less strong female players overall if the player pool is, is just so much lower. So mm -hmm. it would be nice to have more of a centralized push to get more female players. Nowadays we do have a lot of very talented players like uh, Rachel Lee, the younger sister of, of Rufeng Lee, is extremely talented and one of the best juniors in the world, like boy or girl. Uh, we yeah. have a couple other very promising juniors. Um, now we got like Carissa Yip and, and like the new generation of uh, players in like the, the U.S. championship. Um, I think Carissa Yip might be like the number two um, woman or girl under 20 um, <clears throat> oh, okay. in the world. So really like That's high awesome. up there. Um, and there was a point in the U.S. women's championships like two or three years ago where suddenly it was like all teenagers plus like Irina and Anna. Like suddenly, yeah. I mean, there were a couple more, but it was like suddenly like half the field was teenagers where in the past, it's always been like 90% women and one teenager. Right. So we definitely have some players. The question is, are there any like special programs to target them and support them? I guess. Yeah. Which I think would be, would be great. Maybe the changes in streaming are going to support that. I mean, not to go off on too many tangents when we've got a million topics, but <laughs> Um, maybe the changes in the chess world with more online stuff and streaming, there may be some potential for more, uh, women to get into professional chess that way. And there's also, of course, I mean, the very ugly topic of just, uh, the chess culture. Uh, I mean, I've definitely seen tons of examples of not just like sexism, but just also like just uncomfortable. Mm, I don't know how to describe it. Like uncomfortable pressure for for women in tournaments one example i see all the time is like you'll see a girl playing in an open tournament and she might be one of like five girls in a room of a thousand people so that's already like difficult if you're the only like one of a few people in your gender in, in a room full of everyone else and i you'll see guys just like looking at their boards and you get this feeling like they're only watching their board because they're interested in the girl or they like how she looks or they think she's uh, attractive and they're just kind of like creepily like hanging around their board and it's just like very upsetting and I'm sure like the player also is just feeling horrible about that and yeah why would you want to play like a situation like that it makes no yeah. sense so that might be an advantage to playing from home <laughs> big advantage yeah all right you want to do one more uh absolutely this one's a quick one Kostya who is the favorite to win pog champs um so i i don't know i thought about looking up the standings i chose not to i chose not to <laughs> um actually real quick i do want to say alex botez did a really good video talking about her experience dealing with like sexism and harassment in the chess world i'm sure it's on youtube i would encourage everyone to look it up because like uh, i think people yeah just probably don't know what it's like if they haven't been to a lot of chess tournaments it can be very unpleasant for female players and i think just like having some awareness will give people a little bit more more empathy um so my favorite twin pog champs is uh this guy who i i didn't know who he was a few months ago but then i saw his face because he was in pog champs mm -hmm. uh, this guy named uh, david pacman uh and i didn't know who he was but then uh just like last week 
I randomly found his YouTube channel or I saw like a YouTube video that he was in. Apparently he's a big YouTube guy uh, and he's a political commentator. Uh, and I actually really like his stuff. I feel like he's like a super sensible guy. I like his huh. thoughts on stuff. He's just like, he's pretty left leaning, like my politics line up with him. So I, I find myself agreeing with him a lot, but I also feel like he's very reasonable. He doesn't resort to like any kind of like petty attacks or arguments. I just think he's just a very, very sensible voice. Uh, and apparently he's in PogChamp, so I'm rooting for him now. <laughs> Okay, so you're rooting for him. Yeah. Um, yeah, when you first said the name, I was like, David Pacman sounds like a name, not like a handle. So political commentary, not gaming. Okay. Uh, do you think he's a, a favorite to win the thing? Or? He is actually like uh, pretty decent compared to the field. Um, I watched some videos where Naka was showing him like some king and pawn in games, mm -hmm. like how to win with, uh, one, with one extra pawn. And uh, he was... Uh, he picked it up pretty quickly, so he's, I don't know. I think his strength is like maybe twelve or 1,400. Okay. That might be enough to be a favorite. All right, yeah. next topic. Well, did you have a favorite? Uh, no, my answer is I don't know who they are, and I don't care. <laughs> and I think it's random because they're all so low rated that it's just like rolling dice, right? Uh, yeah, it is, pretty, it is pretty random. So, I mean, I think uh, probably the player who wins is just – Whoever can keep their their cool. I haven't seen David play a lot, but uh, I mean Pac Man. But I, I I heard he maybe gets a little bit nervous and blunders uh, under time trouble, which okay. is very normal. But we'll do a poll. We'll do a poll. Um, actually, this might be. Oh, we'll do one more topic after this. We'll do one more, but maybe that'll be the last one because I want to take a quick break before Sunday night fights. Okay. All right, poll is up. We can go to the next topic if you'd like. Champs is not English either, by the way, Lolamento. <laughs> uh, I speak English and I don't know what it is. Pog, I think, originally did stand for play of the game or play of game. Uh, so it refers to some kind of like clutch performance. But then shouldn't it be Potka? Yeah, but that's that's hard to say, as you just found out. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just pog lol is also easier to say than lol you know i think some of these things are very logical that they're changing about our language wait lol is easier to say than what uh lol l-u-l l-u-l -L. L -L. L -L. i think is actually easier to say than l-o-l because now yeah, the kids say right. lol they don't say lol yeah that's true. <laughs> Pogchamp is the dude with the O and the U. But we're really, I mean, it's mostly for typing, not for saying, right? I mean, if you could actually hear me, I wouldn't tell you lol. I would just laugh because we were on Zoom. Oh, you don't say lol? Wow. No. It's, an, it's a new thing. I type it if you can't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, world. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Let's go to the next topic. <laughs> How big is Hikaru signing with esports giant TSM? Okay, David, I'll, I'll have you start this one. Okay. Well, he seemed to think that it was a big deal. Um, I talked previously to Chiyu about her signing, or to Nemo, about her signing with CLG last week. Um... Mm -hmm because she was playing on the Canadian Olympiad team and was on the show. Um, she was happy about it, but she didn't seem to think it was as big a deal as, as he seems to think it is. Um, how big is it? They're a giant, are they? Hmm. Yeah, I heard giants, one of the two biggest esports uh, companies. Giants are, um, giants are big. 
Um, I guess it's pretty big. If TSM is like a bigger outfit than chess.com, if they've got like a bigger budget and following than chess.com, then I guess it's a big deal. Yeah, so I when I found out about the news, I just yeah I didn't really I didn't I mean I've never heard of TSM before this story, um, but other people seem to have taken it like a huge deal, uh, and there was a lot of people in Discord that were like uh, talking about it, um, as if it was like a big deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, now people in the chat telling us TSM much bigger than Chess.com, worth about three hundred million. So yeah, I, I think it's a huge company. Uh, so it seems like a big deal. I haven't, like, I think it is a big deal for people in esports. Basically, the issue for us is that we're we don't feel like we're in esports. Uh, like, I think I'm very new to esports. Basically, uh, one evidence of that is that I didn't know who TSM was, <laughs> or or C9. <laughs> I actually knew who they were. I just didn't know if they're like, if they're like budget and scope and following was bigger than Chess.com's. I see. Like, I'm, I'm aware that people play, like, Call of Duty and, like, other games at, like, a very high level. That I'm, I'm aware of, like, the, the concept of esports. I just didn't know anything about um, these uh, these companies. I did hear yeah. about uh, Chiyu signing with, with that other one. But, CLG. Um, um, yeah, Chiyu is a woman's grandmaster like- from Canada who plays chess and League of Legends. Hmm. But yeah, I think it is it is good. Like, I mean, uh, kind of similar to why PogChamps is good for chess. Like, it's going to bring more people in and get chess at like a higher stage and just get a lot more eyeballs on the game. Mm-hmm. That I think it's definitely uh, definitely worth it and a great thing. Yeah, I guess to me this signing's not that shocking. I've already sort of like thought and talked for a while about how Hikaru's reached like a wider audience and kind of crossed over from the chess community to like a bigger community. And I think a few other chess players are kind of following him in that regard. I mean, I say following, even if Nemo signed one week before him, I still think it's sort of like Hikaru has been like the leader in chess streaming. I think it's still fair to say. Um, So I'm going to say it. Um, (laughs) So I think like this is sort of like a symptom of a bigger thing that was already happening. I don't know how big a deal it is because also to me it was like expected. You know, sometimes like sometimes when something expected happens, it doesn't like give you this feeling like, oh my God, it's huge. Because you're like, yes, this was the natural thing that was going to happen. It's part of a whole context of chess is is growing at the moment and um, crossing over and people are stuck at home and They've got so few awesome things to do that they end up listening to Hikaru. Um, and yeah, I remember when Hikaru signed with uh, Red Bull, and I, I felt like similar. Although I I knew who Red Bull was back then, and yeah. I knew they were a big company. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm with you. It's like yeah, definitely not surprising that he got some sponsorship. I mean, especially for for streaming and Twitch. He's I mean, he's absolutely um, huge. Uh, but so I guess the the big deal is that this is the first time they've signed a chess player. Uh, so this is the first time the chess is being recognized, like or one of the first few times that chess is being recognized within the esports community. So I can see why that would be cool for people. If chess mm-hmm. is something you've always kind of liked on the side and you've liked esports, and now you have esports saying like, oh, chess is like a legit thing, and yeah. they're like kind of investing. So I, I can totally see why that would be really, really cool for fans. Yeah, I could see how it's like a big validation for somebody who was really like caring about it. Um, And I guess I just had the perspective already that chess was getting to that point. So it's not like a big (laughs) shock to me. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I I can see how it's sort of like a tangible or obvious way for some people to, to see that. Yeah, for me, chess is bigger than than esports. And like, with all due respect to video games, like, Chess has been around for hundreds of years and is still going really strong. So, like, you guys call us when you have a game that's around for hundreds of years that people are still playing. Yeah. Uh, I think that's not easy to do uh, with, with video games, right? Like, there are only so many so many classics. Yeah. All right. Good show, Kostya. Yeah, we're going to take a quick break here. We'll kick our other um, topics down the road. Um, I'll do half an hour of Blitz, and then you'll be back for Sunday Night Fights. 
Nice. So how do you want to do it? Do you want me to set up the the stream and then we'll Yeah, we'll you can probably show? set up the stream and then you just ping me when you want me to get off and I'll and I'll be Sounds back. Good. 3 a.m. Krishna. All right. We'll see you next time. Everybody else stick around. We're not done. We got a couple hours to go. We're going to do some chess now. Bit.